Hi everyone, thanks for being here. My name is Anna Willig and I'm talking about two different approaches to monitoring the salty stream problem. So I'm from Willistown Conservation Trust and if you haven't heard of us, we're a land trust located in the Newtown Square area. We started back in the 1990s focused on land protection and we've grown since to include a number of different program areas including the Watershed Protection Program which is where I work. And we're really focused on looking at connections between land use and water quality in the headwaters of Ridley, Crum, and Darby Creek which is where we're located. So the two frameworks I'm going to be talking about are a long-term high-frequency program that we run in-house at Willistown and a community science program. It's the Darby Creek Community Science Monitoring Program, and we run that in partnership with Darby Creek Valley Association and Stroudwater Research Center. So looking at our long-term high-frequency program, we go out to 10 sample sites every month in the headwaters of Ridley, Crum, and Darby Creek. And just to orient you on this map, we're about 30 miles west of Philadelphia, so this little red square here is the area that's blown yes. up. These rivers are all tributaries that drain directly into the Delaware, south of Philadelphia. And we, like I said, we visit these 10 sites every month. We take a day, go out, collect water quality data. Uh, we've been doing this since 2018, and we've really started focusing on chloride and road salt since 2019. So some of the benefits of this program, it's a very rigorous data set. These are data that we collect, um, collected by highly trained scientific staff, uh, so it's very reliable data. We are focused on the headwaters here, which is an area that's traditionally understudied, so it's nice to be able to fill in that data gap a bit. Um, since we're out there every month, we capture seasonal trends. We see how things change in the winter and the summer, how these streams respond to different weather events, all that good stuff. Um, and we go out in one day, so kind of like Dave mentioned, we have the same condition at all the streams. It's not like there's a big storm in the middle that's going to change things. Um, the downside, it's geographically limiting. We can only get to what we can get to in a day, so we're pretty um, restricted to just the headwater area. It's time intensive, just takes a while to prepare, collect samples, do the analysis. And we're not out there all the time, unlike the Enviro DIY sensors, we can't capture the extremes. So the other framework that we use is a community science program. And this is focused solely in the Darby Creek watershed, and we have sites in the headwaters all the way down to the main stem. And the, again, it's a partnership program with us, DCBA, and Stroud. We started back in March 2021 with just two sample sites, and we now have 17, and we're actually adding three more this weekend. So it's really grown well, and we're excited about this program. Um, and these are data that are collected by volunteers. So we wanted this program to be as accessible to people as possible. So rather than just have one day every four weeks when people go out, it's a four-day window. So volunteers can go out from Thursday to Sunday, which makes it available to people who are retired, working, or anywhere in between. Benefits, like you saw, broader geographic range, headwaters all the way down. More sites, there are 20 sites that will be active after this weekend, so that's just a lot more data that we can get on our own. Um, and it's direct community involvement and outreach. All of these volunteers are just people who are interested in the watershed. Some of them have to have a background in this sort of work, most of them don't, and a lot of them live very close to the sites where they're sampling. So it's a great way to get them interested and involved in what's going on near them. The drawbacks is that when you're working with volunteers, there's always just a little bit of a higher rate of error. No matter how well they're trained, things can just slip through the cracks sometimes. Since there's a four-day window, you start to um, have more variation in the data. So someone could go out on a Thursday, there could be a big storm, someone else goes out on Sunday, and the data looked completely different just because the creek was in two very different conditions. And again, we can't send them out there all the time. They're not going to get those extremes. So using this data, we're able to do a lot of different outreach. Um, one of the, our major outreach um, deliverables was the State of Our Streams report. And this is a scientific document based on our 10 sites, which are in blue. Um, that we developed to be appropriate for our research partners while remaining accessible for a lay audience. So if you want to check it out, it's wcttrust.org slash watershed. Shameless plug, it's a great document. Um, we also do a number of education events for the public. We do um, lectures, we write blog posts, we do social media posts, and we're starting to get more into that municipal world, talking a little bit to environmental advisory committees, sometimes talking directly to the municipalities themselves. So we're still hoping to get them on board to start addressing this issue. Also, like I mentioned, all of the volunteers, most of them live in the Darby Creek watershed, many of them right near their sample sites. And we found that just by sending them out to collect data and monitor the stream, 
they're starting to really pick up on what's going on and becoming a great network of advocates for their watershed. So I've mentioned data. Let's take a look at our data. Um, so this shows chloride concentration um, over time. And so what you can see is these blue sample sites are the ones that we do in-house at Willistown. And then these orangey red sample sites are the ones that our volunteers collect. So immediately what you can see is that there's just much greater variability in Darby Creek. Um, this is partially because, like I mentioned, there's differences in weather that can occur during sampling periods. And they're also just across very different sections of the creek, so things are just going to look different. One of the main drivers in these differences, like Dave mentioned, is land use. And so this figure here shows impervious surface cover, roads, parking lots, anything water can't pass through, and chloride concentration. And what you can see is that it's a very tight relationship. The more impervious surfaces you get, the more development you get, the more salt you have. And this it makes sense, you don't really apply road salt to anything that's not impervious. So it's a clear relationship and it's just very helpful to see this in our area so that we can start to get more people aware and involved in fixing this issue. And so kind of a cautionary tale, you might see this site down here and wonder why it has so much impervious surface cover, such low chloride concentration. And I really wish it could be a great story about good stormwater management, low road salt application. It is not. <laughs> this volunteer just had a bad batch of chloride strips and we didn't catch it for a long time. We thought for a while they were just always going out after a rainstorm and everything was really diluted. But in fact, the chloride strips were just bad. So we have to, it's just a couple months of data we have to get rid of entirely, which is a bit of a shame, but it just kind of highlights that point that community science is great. You can get a lot of data, you can get a lot of good data, but the quality control piece is critical to making sure it's accurate and reliable. So just, some final conclusions. If you want to start looking at the salt problem, there are a lot of different frameworks you can use depending on your budget limitations and the questions that you're asking. Um, unsurprisingly, salt's a contaminant. Dave said that, everyone's gonna say that. Um, and it's really, it is at levels where pretty frequently above that 50 um, megs per liter threshold. So it's impacting stream ecology and really needs to be addressed. Um, it's the poster child for land use. You go around and you see a white road during the winter and then you see chloride spike the next day and it's hard to get much more of a clear relationship than that. And so that's really helpful to start to get people just thinking in general about connections between land use and water quality and how everything that happens on the land impacts the water. And so finally, community involvement is critical for creating any sort of change. So we found that the community science is a really great way to get people involved but any number of outreach tools can be used to get people interested and involved, and that's just critical if you want to start to address this. So with that, um, thank you all to the staff at Willistown. Thank you to all our amazing Darby Creek volunteers, um, our research partners, donors, supporters, and Jennifer Mathis for all these photos. And I'll turn it over to Krista. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the New Jersey Highlands. Um, that's where my watershed is located. Um, it's much different looking than a lot of the other watersheds that look kind of like a bowl. This one is more like a long chute. So it's 42 mm -hmm. miles long and we have to monitor it um, when we do the salt snapshots in regions just because it's an hour and a half from top to bottom of the watershed. We also have two independently managed lakes. We have Lake Pakong and Lake Muskinetkong as our headwaters. Um, so. For our road salt monitoring, we've been doing this for two seasons now. We've been doing the pre and post storm measurements. We go out there with the same chloride strips you've been seeing pictures of and the same handheld meters. <coughs> uh, we have a community science group called River Watchers. This is going on their 15th year of data collection, so we have lots of good long-term data. And now we're adding the salt and chloride to that. So here's our sampling regions. This is how we break it up. Um, for the pre and post storm, we kind of give them some autonomy. We give some team leaders and let them organize how they go out um, and coordinate. I think that gives a little more buy-in to community scientists. They feel a little more in charge of the monitoring. So we break it up into five regions and kind of give them the parameters by, by which to go out and monitor. Uh, so like you've been seeing these rating curves, we take that, make these rating curves, and we get an equation so that in the future, we don't really need to keep going out with these chloride strips. We can use those HANA meters or Enviro DIY. That's continuously con you know, collecting conductivity. Uh, you've seen these before. I'll just 
hit on it real quick, 860 for that acute toxicity level, 230 uh, for chronic toxicity, and I did put 250 here for human health levels because I am going to talk about drinking water just a little bit. Um, and above these levels, what happens? We keep talking about how it's bad for the environment. Well, what does it actually do? Uh, it inhibits the reproduction and growth of fish. It leads to the extirpation or local extinction of a lot of the sensitive insects that the fish eat. Uh, it leads to die-off of aquatic plants, and they're also seeing a big link to high conductivity and chloride in areas and had blooms, so harmful algal blooms. Um, it also leads to decreased biodiversity. And something I would like to point out is that that research by Ohio and Maryland and using that 50 milligram per liter uh, threshold is especially uh, important for when you're talking about freshwater mussels. The glochidia or the larvae of freshwater mussels are in peril in a lot of our streams and that is the threshold at which a lot of them are in danger. Um, and a lot of the protections that the Musconetcon watershed has is because we have threatened and endangered mussel species. So it's, you know, definitely something we want to get under control. So talking about the, you know, well water problem, uh, in Warren County in the New Jersey Highlands, there is actually a township that is suing the DOT because there has been so much salt intrusion into their well water that most people cannot drink it now. Um, people with any kind of heart condition have, you know, not been able to been drinking their water for a couple of years now. So when we do these salt snapshots, we ask people to bring in their tap water so that they can get a little buy-in and know what they're drinking and what's going on in their groundwater in their area. So when we did, you know, the two years worth of pre and post storm um, monitoring, we found that as you can see, salt here up at the headwaters and it gets less and less downstream, which is a little odd. You would think it would kind of gather as it went down. But like I said, we have two headwater lakes that are pretty much urban lakes at this point uh, and much more density as far as development. So we find these hot spots and then we go and we contribute this data also statewide to uh, the Watershed Institute, which has a program called the New Jersey Watershed Watch Network. And as you can see, I'm pretty proud. This is the Musconetcon right here lit up uh, by all of our data points. And so, in addition to this pre- and post-storm monitoring, like people have been talking about, we've been doing salt snapshots, region by region. Um, and we started in region two, and I'll tell you why um, in just a second here. We started in Hackettstown. Uh, it's one of our more urbanized areas in the watershed, a little bit further up. It's also a focal point for a 3 not, uh, 319 non-point source grant that we have. And that gives us money from the Clean Water Act to go and really focus in on an area, come up with a nine element plan, and then, you know, out of that plan and stakeholder feedback and the data we collected, you know, recommend best management practices, one of those being best management practices for salt application. And then this is what we found. Here's our snapshot from that region. Anything in yellow is uh, above that 50 milligram uh, criteria, and I, anything in orange is above the 120. And so here's Region 3. Again, this is still in our focal area for our 319 grin. Um, and then here's that map, and here's those data points. And so in between all of this, in between the two seasons of monitoring, I really wanted to get some community engagement going around this. So I gathered up um, some experts in the area. I got uh, WIT advisors, Phil Sexton. He's done tons of research over the last 15 years. He used to be um, on the application side, now he's on the consulting side, and he has tons of great knowledge around um, data-driven salt use and how to reduce it. I had uh, the DE NJDEP give a talk about the agency's input there. Um, I had the New Jersey Watershed Watch Network come and talk. And basically it was just people bringing together all of their knowledge um, in a format, like you said, shameless plug, this is on YouTube, so you can go to Muskie Watershed here and, and watch this at your leisure. Um, but put this in a format that's informative and not confrontational, you know, just something that everybody can sit uh, around and, and have a really good chat about at the end. And it, it really did come down to some really good talks at the end of this about what you can do. Uh, the big takeaways from these presentations 
was that, you know, we all talk about road salts and we think roads, right? We think highway, but really 50% comes from parking lots. Those are independent contractors that are salting and they, they have liability on their mind and they have their budget on their mind, right? They get a certain amount of salt per year, they have a budget for it, and they're, you know, deathly afraid of somebody slipping and falling and it being their fault in that parking lot. And Dave showed you that picture in the beginning where you probably weren't even touching asphalt as you walked across that parking lot, that you were like literally skating across on salt grains, right? Um, and then also it came up that we need a way for community members to be able to voice this opinion to uh, business owners and um, DPWs and DOTs. So I've created a template email that all of my river watchers have access to. They can fill in the name of the business. There's lots of links in it that take you to Stroud's articles, to the New Jersey Watershed Watch, uh, mapping to, to, to our data and things like that. So they don't have to always come up with all of this on their own. They can take this, make it their own, and pass it along. Um, so where do we go now in the Musconet Com? We have lots of data. You know, we're a very data-driven organization. Um, so I told you about that 319 grant, but that's only a portion of the watershed. Um, and I also mentioned that we're a wild and scenic river. With that comes some money from the National Park Service. And with that money, we do a lot of monitoring. Um, and then we go for other grants, right? So part of our new strategic plan is to really come up with a watershed-wide plan. Uh, planning and implementation grants like the 319 are a good place to start if you're looking to get some money to do some planning and monitoring. Um, and then putting together those plans, right? Going around, you know, there are a ton of, you know, plans out there. Here's an ex not an exhaustive list, right? You've got people that, like the Lake Apatcong and Lake Musconetcom, they have their own management plans. You have open space institutes, they have their own management plans. You have, um, you know, we live in the New Jersey Highlands. They have the Highlands Act and the Highlands Coalition. They have plans. There's water man management level, you know, plans. And it goes on and on, right? Trout on the edge. They have trout habitat recovery plans. So it gives you some time and space and money to actually sit and look at all of these things and take all of that data and come up with a comprehensive plan to not just manage road salts, but other pollutants as well. So thank you very much. Uh, that's my email, and I have something for all of you, actually. I come there and gifts. So this cup can do your entire driveway. <laughs> <laughs> if you do it right. There's a space on there that shows you how far apart the grains of salt should be. Or 10 sidewalk squares. Hello, my name is Pete Goodman and I am the environmental chairperson of the Valley Forge chapter of Trout Unlimited. Valley Forge Trout Unlimited, VFTU, is a local chapter of the national organization Trout Unlimited, which is a conservation organization focused on cold water fisheries for salmon and trout. Have been trying to protect and restore local streams for 25 years. My focus has been on local streams with a hyper attention on the Valley Creek watershed. Valley Creek empties into the Schuylkill River at the uh, Valley Forge National Historical Park. Valley Creek is a limestone creek which means it's underlain by limestone geology, which makes it different from streams in the area like Ridley Creek and French Creek. Due to the limestone influence, there are many springs that flush cold water into Valley Creek. Cold water supports a class A wild brown trout fishery its highest classification, and all the trout in the stream are born there. When I first started out trying to protect Valley Creek, I was pretty sure 
we were going to lose the trout due to increased temperatures of the stream, due to increasing development with ever increasing impervious surfaces. And we could watch the median stream temperature rise as that happened. Now, however, my concern has shifted to salt pollution. I first became aware of salt pollution in Valley Creek through a watersheds meeting at the Chester County Water Resources Authority and a presentation by Drew Reef of USGS. Valley Creek has some of the highest concentrations in the county. Uh, that was pre-COVID when I first got the indications that the salt pollution was increasing. Last year, David Bressler of Stroud Water Research asked Trout Unlimited if we were interested in producing a salt fact sheet on pollution. I accepted and uh, we created that fact sheet. That task was a bit harder and took a little longer than I anticipated, but we did it. And we used 61 years of historic data and created a chart in the mid center of the, uh, the fact sheet. And it shows the ever increasing faultiness of uh, Valley Creek and the fact that we're getting very close to levels that will uh, be killing the life in Valley Creek. Up until then, my primary data information source, which Chester County Water Resources, uh, but on November 9th, 2022, with the help of Stroud, we performed a, um, a salt snapshot in Valley Creek. We visited 52 different locations with a dozen or so volunteers and tested for uh, chlorides and uh, conductivity. Our chloride values ranged from a low of 34 milligrams per liter in one location in the watershed to a high of 281 milligrams per liter, which occurred in two different locations. We've gone back to one of the highest reading locations, uh, which was in Krabby Creek near Conestoga High School. It's located in the lower right of uh, the map there. It was site 48, um, but we could not identify the, the high sources. Uh, the source was not apparent. David Bressler created this bar chart for us uh, using the data from that snapshot. And it's uh, kind of illustrative of how polluted Valley Creek is. We are above the chronic toxicity, toxicity criterion of 230 milligrams per liter uh, in uh, roughly a third of the uh, of the watershed um, and this is all background uh, flow information this is not uh, due to spikes uh, caused by road salt applications in the winter it was uh, this was low low stream flow that was measured So it's fine to produce an eye-catching brochure about salt pollution, but I felt that it needed to be presented to a broader audience. Uh, 
first BFTU created a salt pollution webpage with the Valley Creek salt pollution chart prominent on that page. At the bottom of the page, there are printable version links to the printable version of the, our fact sheet as well as additional information. Then I took the salt pollution fact sheet on the road. We actually designed the fact sheet with the target audience being township EACs, um, environmental advisory council. So that's where I went. We went uh, first to my home EAC at Charlestown and then to Tredyffrin and later to East Whiteland. At the end of January, I presented via Zoom to the Northern Chester County EAC group, uh, which reached 12 individual EACs. Most recently, I presented to the East Town EAC. At every presentation, I have asked to have the EACs approach their township and get uh, whatever salt information, salt use information or purchase information they could acquire. As of now, I have only Charlestown's information, but uh, I will circle back around and uh, re-ask the EACs for the, the salt use information. I wrote two articles on salt pollution, which appeared in different township newsletters, the Valley Creek Restoration Partnerships January meeting um, was focused on salt reduction. And we hosted the uh, Aubrey Volker of New Hampshire's Department of Environmental Services uh, who talked about their salt reduction program, uh, Green Snow Pro. They've been, they have a very aggressive and uh, successful program, um, which includes a limited liability law uh, for applicators who have uh, been through the uh, program. Very progressive. Um, there was considerable interest in the uh, salt fact sheet at uh, our, the Valley Forge Trout Unlimited booth at the fly fishing show in Lancaster at the beginning of the month. So what's next? I'll keep talking and handing out our fact sheet. I'll follow up with EACs for their, fall, their salt use um, or purchase information. We have been thinking of putting together an educational seminar for public, local public works directors and perhaps working with Chester County Water Resources Authority on some educational pamphlets which would be directed uh, towards best management practices. And the last piece is to start an awareness campaign directed at our local and state elected officials to advocate for a salt applier certification. And this is something that has happened in other locales that are affected by um, salt pollution impacts. So that's going to be the the heavy lift is to uh, get that out to the elected officials and uh, see if we can't get a SALT uh, appliers certification program in Pennsylvania. That is going to be where the rubber meets the road. If we do nothing, we will lose our streams and that's not an option for me. Okay, I'm just going to follow up on Pete's two more slides. Um, Pete's 
I just wanted to re-show that graph. Pete's uh, lines were sort of offset. So this is the graph where they're supposed to be. So there's not as many as Pete suggested that are over the 230 line. But when you get to that Canada line of 120, it starts to look really bad. And then almost every stream in Valley Creek watershed is above that 50 threshold. Um, and then just to wrap things up, so as we pointed out, road salt pollution is prevalent and getting worse, and it's especially in these impervious areas. Monitoring is relatively straightforward. You just have to allocate the time and the people and you know, plan properly to make that happen, but you can get good data. Um, it's, as Pete indicated, it's sort of this, like, you know, what do you do with the data? And, and how do you influence the salt management and application practices? That's more challenging. So local policy and practice, as Pete pointed out, dialogue with local managers, local communities, um, and trying to just build momentum, again, as Pete was referencing, um, presenting methods that can be used for change, hoping that that, that gets momentum and, and things can be improved. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the, poll foiled, the poll foiled me again. All right, so um, that's it. That's all our contact information. And thank you, everyone. We do have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, I, if, if, if there's any eager volunteers to, uh, to ask a question, um, I'll let you address either a specific presenter or they can jump in as who's got uh, interest in answering. Yeah. yeah, well, my big question, my daughter used to live in Portland, Oregon. They don't use any salt. They use gravel, and in the spring they sweep it up, and how come we can't push that sort of uh, gravel versus salt? Not doing less salt, just switch to gravel. So that's a question, I guess, in, in general. I don't know that anybody's got an answer for that. But I can answer that in, yes. in a particular way, and that is the gravel is harder to get out of storm drains because it does end up in the storm drain. Then you have to vacuum that drain. Uh, but salt is a bigger problem, and one of the things that I have a question is, is that is there a ordinance that we can get passed through municipalities, <coughs> through different counties, in order to correct the salt problem? Management of salt in parking lots for shopping centers and stuff like that needs to be addressed. And and I I, mean, I used to be a zoning officer in a couple of different municipalities in Bucks County. And when I addressed it, we got them to block off by putting concrete blocks down and saw bells in front of that, and then the salt behind that with an apron, and it and minimized the runoff of that salt, mm -hmm. so that the grass behind it wasn't killed for. From the salt the pile, you mean? Yeah, yeah, from the salt piles. So the thing is, is that if we could get an ordinance that states that all the municipalities have to be responsible for the salt runoff in their areas, along with the shopping centers and the industrial parks and the office complexes, that's the way to fight it, and that works also. So the, the challenge right now is PennDOT doesn't recognize salt as a problem. We know that. <laughs> if they, don't, they train the municipalities. So they're messaging through their salt training programs. This is all PA, not New Jersey. New right. Jersey is a little more forward thinking. Maryland is decades ahead of so, Pennsylvania. The best thing we could do is actually get Maryland to come up and show Pennsylvania how they reduce their salt load from Maryland DOT by 50%. 50%. They went to straight briny, right in the middle of the storm. But right now, um, to the best of my knowledge, our, part of our problem is in Harrisburg, and I was talking to Pennsylvania DEP about that. They're aware of it. They, too, are, are not quite sure how to begin this conversation without a code. They don't, there's no regulatory threshold that says you road salt the problem. They have, there are no streams that are currently listed as impaired due to solemnization. That will change, though, based on what I hear them doing. They're going to go at it in the back door. Well, we cut our soft budget in one municipality by simply only, inter only, only salting the intersections for 
50 feet from a stop sign. This way, the cars have the opportunity to stop, and once they go through it, they, they pick up that salt and they travel it further up. So after we salted it and we started measuring it, you know, it was another 75 feet of travel salt after the intersection. So that's 125 feet of salted road that we didn't have to salt all together. I'd like to hear more about how that worked. So <laughs> fire, fire me an email, please. Yeah, where, where is Philadelphia in this salting problem? Uh, Philadelphia has the advantage of putting all their streams in pipes. So, <laughs> they're salting problems in the underground. They, you can't send volunteers out very easily. Um, you know, the West Hicken is the closest, uh, and the Penny Pack on, on the uh, east side. But um, they're aware of it. I've talked to city council, yeah. to Philadelphia city council. Politicians are painted into a corner. If you remember the 90s, snowstorms resulted in bad snow events that resulted in politicians losing their jobs because their replacement said, I will do a better job with salt. Mm -hmm. um, if you saw the data that was up there, there's a big jump that started in the mid-90s mid, mid where we, we're now using two and a half times as much salt as we did in the 90s. And that, in part, was because of the politics of salty promoted it. Um, the other was, some of it is suburbanization. But, um, so Philadelphia is, is not doing anything different than anybody else. They're salty. This is what Pennsylvania DOT told me maybe three years ago. I will salt as much as possible because my bosses never complain about too much salt. They only complain about too little salt. That's based on phone calls, expectations from the public, leaning on the politicians. But all the road salt goes down the drains and, it, and that leads to the river. Yes. So isn't the Scoop Hill and, and uh, the Delaware? They're both going up. But remember, both, both watersheds are about 60% forest. So they have the advantage of some of these smaller suburban and urban streams, which um, are dominated by transportation and parking landscapes, where the salt's being applied. So actually, the Scoop Hill and the Delaware have far less salt than, say, Valley Creek or the Musconnecton, because they're, they're, of their dilution capacity from their rural landscape. Question. Um, um, so, what's his, his name? Pete was talking about um, trying to get a, a, um, like a green snow pro type of program here in Pennsylvania. Do you know of any like centralized effort to do lobbying or something to make that happen? Is there anything organized around that? It's one thing to say we need it, but um, like, you need I, to kind of get together. You know, it's embryonic. Um, right now, I would say reach out to Pete and let him know because I do believe it's going to require a collective effort. Mm -hmm. That one voice in Harrisburg, one voice in Trenton isn't going to change this. It's going to take a lot of voices unified. Um, you know, one of the more remarkable things about all of this is you see dump truck after dump truck all winter. 50 years of Clean Water Act, how did that happen? How did we do, I mean, if this was dirt going onto roads, people would be having a conniption. But the salt dissolves and they thought, out of sight, out of mind. It wasn't until the data started showing, and then most people don't realize the data have been part of the communication for 20 years now, and we still haven't cut back, we've increased it more. Our use. So, and one other thing, the question about the Schuylkill, the Schuylkill data that Philly Water has collected, to my knowledge, is one of the first papers that documented the increase. They looked at data from the mid-70s to 1999, published it in 2003. Chris Crockett did that, and he was with Philly Water. Uh, um, and so it is Philadelphia drinking water to some degree 
was the first time we had the data that said salt in streams is increasing. Two years later, there was a bigger study that came out that looked at a bunch of, of rivers. But the Schuylkill, to my knowledge, is the first one that really red flagged it. Um, do you know that if there's any like, solid data that's been produced around the state of the difference in the amount of salt that's going in from private contractors as opposed to um, you know, local authorities putting salt on the road. For example, I, I live in the Lehigh Valley and the last few years they've switched over to brining there, which my understanding is that makes a big difference, but it would still be nice to kind of know the difference that there are all these warehouses and places where I'm sure there's all kinds of salt going down in those places. Is, is there anything to kind of show the difference of, you know, so far in data collection? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's data on it off the top of my head. The thing you always hear is that the private application is the, you know, the wild card, and they just, mm -hmm. you know, can, can, can be really. I, I'm just thinking in terms of having, you know, more leverage in terms of this contractor program. Yeah, that's and that's the New Hampshire yeah. program. That's that's <clears throat> that's focused on private contractors. Right, but I mean, if you've got data that shows they're putting way more than they share salt. So Pete showed in one study that's done by the WIT guys, which was actually his work, but there are a number of TMDLs. The easiest way to say this is the role of parking lots depends on your watershed. So if you're, that's why we do these high density sampling, because the culprit depends on the land use upstream of the point you're, you're sampling. So there, you may be sampling a small watershed that's draining off of the turnpike and the turnpike only. You may be sampling a watershed that's all parking lots. Uh, Valley Creek is parking lots and the turnpike and state routes. Um, so it depends. So that's the tricky thing about saying there's one bad egg. There's not one. It really depends. The worst sites that we found around Westchester are going to be state routes driven by state routes and parking lots. Who's more important? We're trying to figure that out with these surveys to look at what is being applied because that's the data point we don't have. How, who's, who's applying how much, where? So we're gonna go at it backwards. Let them, what's in the stream, let them guess what they're applying and see if there's an interface. 